In those days a decree went out from an emperor, Augustus, that all the words should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from their town of Nazareth of Galilee to Judea, Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house in the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in in a major, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel and multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made us known to us. So they went with his haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child laying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Ladies, you can stay up here. Beautiful. These are maybe new friends that I just met, Sherlyn and Lisa, and I'm just so thankful that they would read the scripture for us today. So would you pray? Lord God, we thank you for your word. Your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. May your word go forth today and accomplish what you send it forth to do. Lord, thank you for uh, your love for us and for the way that you desire to speak to us. So would you do that this morning as we hear and speak your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Give our friends a hand. So friends, I am Michelle Christie. I'm the Director of Adult Discipleship here, and uh, I say this every time, but it is a, a humble privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you today. And So we are in the third week of our Advent series, The Christmas Gospel. The last two weeks we've heard, uh, out of the, heard from Mark and Matthew. Uh, we learned from Mark that uh, there was a new king coming and that the kingdom was near, and we heard about John the Baptist announcing uh, his coming. In Matthew's gospel, we learned that it was specific to a Jewish culture and that Matthew listed in the genealogy of Jesus some very unlikely characters. And we also heard about this troop of international wise men that came to see Jesus. And Matthew started his gospel with a confounded father, Joseph. Today, as we look at Luke, we heard the words read for us, We know that Luke is a Gentile, a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, a physician, and writes with a mastery of the Greek language with meticulous detail. It must be his training as a physician. But he helps us see that his narrative is within the context of secular events on the world, the the stage of world history. Luke states at the outset that he wanted to, to write an orderly account that would bring certainty, certain knowing to those who would read it, of the life and the purpose and the ministry of Jesus Christ, and that his love was for all people. Unlike the other gospel writers, Luke, and as he begins in verse 3, he addresses his narrative to a man named Theophilus. 
which literally means beloved of God and carries with it this connotation of friendship with God. Theophilus was a patron, maybe helped Luke spread this narrative, helped finance it, uh, this, this narrative as well as the, the Acts of the Apostle. But when I think about his letter being addressed to Theophilus, which means beloved of God, I wonder if it isn't an invitation for us this morning. Luke's narrative, his words, that we might receive it as the beloved of God in friendship with the Lord. What might God want to say to you this morning? What might he want to speak into your heart? How might we, with fresh ears and eyes, hear the words of the Christmas story afresh and new as the beloved of God? So, as Pastor Brian mentioned last week, and I mentioned it just a minute ago, that in my Matthew there are some unlikely characters, and we find the same thing in Luke. But Luke shares specific stories throughout his gospel that are shared nowhere else. Luke emphasizes the universal and inclusive nature of God's love in Jesus Christ. He names their stories, some of them, or most of them, Gentiles, considered social outcasts, the immoral, the tax collectors, uh, a dying and believing criminal hanging on a cross, the prodigal son, the Samaritans, half-breeds considered by the Jewish people, a leper, poor people, the lowly, and the forgotten. As well, the universal nature of Luke's gospel is seen in, in how he portrays women, particularly in the birth narrative. And while we didn't read Luke 1, I'm going to try and give us a quick uh, context or synopsis of what, what we hear about Elizabeth and Mary before we turn to the specific scriptures read today. But he begins by telling us of John the Baptist as well. You see, an angel appeared to Zechariah who was ministering in the temple, and, and the angel says to Zechariah, your barren, shame-filled wife Elizabeth in her old age is going to bear a son. And Zechariah responds with disbelief. But indeed, Baron Elizabeth does become pregnant in her old age, and she plays the role of mentor and blesser of Mary, the mother of Jesus. The unlikely Elizabeth is exalted by the Lord in her shame and in her sorrow to play a role in God's kingdom. And then the story moves outward from the temple 90 miles to an outlying village called Nazareth where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and announces that she is the favored one. She is the chosen one that is going to bear the Son of God. She's a lowly peasant girl, chosen, unsuspecting, and the angel tells her all these things. And what does this peasant girl do but bend her knee and in a stunning statement says, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be unto me as you say. And she follows with a beautiful song of praise for God's mercy and his faithfulness and strength toward the humble and the lowly. This budding 13-ish, unlikely Mary, is chosen in humility and faithfulness to be the mother of the Savior of the world. And then we arrive at the scriptures that Sherlin and Lisa read for us. And we hear that Mary and Joseph travel south from Nazareth, submitting to the Roman Empire's degree, decree for all to be registered to pay their due taxes to Caesar Augustus. In a profound way, God weaves the prophecies of the Old Testament together in divine providence so that the time for the babe to be born would come when they were in Bethlehem, the city of their registration. And there was no appropriate room for the swollen-bellied wife of Joseph. They were relegated to a cave of sorts which sheltered animals amidst the dung-tinged hay, the braying of donkeys, and the buying of sheep, and the mooing of cows. The unlikely Mary births the long-waited Christ Messiah. The babe whom the angel had announced to Mary would be named Jesus, the Son of the Most High, the one who would sit on the throne of his father David, and he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. This babe, laid in a manger, breathed his first breath, swaddled in claws that were most likely used by shepherds to swaddle sheep to keep them spotless and unblemished. 
for temple sacrifice. The unlikely Mary births in a most unlikely place and way to a world hardly prepared for the Messiah. I want us to pause for a minute before we go on in the story, and I want us to see Luke's narrative around the birth of Jesus. You see, it began in the temple with Zechariah, the center of worship, the place where God's spirit and presence dwelled. It then moves outward to a village, Nazareth, and to a village, Bethlehem. And then from there, it moves even further out from the center to the fringes, to the fields, where we find some of the most unlikely people the most unlikely candidates for a visit from the Lord. I want us to catch this, you see, because it's the one born in the stable, Jesus. He came to bring the love and the presence of God for the people to the people. The advent of Jesus brought a new day. Jeremiah talked about it. Ezekiel talked about it and said there will come a day when, when um, God will be their people and they will be God's people and I will dwell in their hearts the law will no longer be written on stone tablets, but it will be written in their hearts and in their minds. This is profound movement, friends, from the center to the fringes. The temple was no longer the center of God's presence. God himself came in the flesh to move toward the people, and in fact, toward those who are most often overlooked and forgotten. And Luke invites us to see these amazing things, this profound shift, by using one little word, and it's one of my favorite words in Scripture, behold. And that might sound like a funny thing to say, behold. Like, it's not in all translations, but it's in the original language. And when we hear that word, it means and it invites us to, to consider what's happening. And most often, it is centered around uh, something that is happening that shouldn't be happening. Let me give you some examples from Luke. He uses it eight times, the most of any of the writers in the New Testament. In 120, a priest in the service of God, he displayed unbelief. Of all people, he should have been one to believe when the angel showed up. In Luke 131, Mary would conceive without knowing a man by the Holy Spirit. Whoa, like that doesn't happen, but it's happening. And then, her, then, then Elizabeth, old, barren, shame-filled, the least in the culture, she, as a woman, she couldn't bear children. She, in her 90s, I don't know, 80s, bears a child. That shouldn't be happening, but it is. Mary's surrender, like I said, right? Who does that as a 13-year-old girl gets this news and goes, what in the world? But she says, let it be unto me according to your word. That shouldn't be happening, but it is. The recognition when she goes to see Elizabeth we didn't cover that story, but the, the babe, John the Baptist in Elizabeth's belly, and the, the babe, the Christ in Mary's belly, they, as they meet up, the two women meet, they begin to stir. Like, what is that about? And Luke 148, Mary says, generations will call me blessed, for God has done great things for the humble and the lowly. This peasant girl, that shouldn't be happening. And in 210, we hear it, we heard it. The good news of great joy will be for all people. You see, this is a shift from the temple to the fringes. This good news is for all people. That shouldn't necessarily be happening, but it is. Behold. Luke's meticulous narrative speaks this. Born in an unlikely place and way, to an unlikely people is the unlikely Savior. Born in an unlikely place and way to an unlikely people is an unlikely Savior. So let's look at these unlikelies, these shepherds out in the fields keeping watch by night. We sang about it. These shepherds are unlikely, and they exemplify the unlikelies of the world. You see, a shepherd in the Near East watches out for the enemies of the sheep. He defends the sheep. He heals the wounded. He finds the, the lost and the trapped sheep. He loves the sheep. He earns the sheep's trust. Most people throughout the Roman Empire viewed shepherds as lowly, sometimes as rough, unclean, or even dangerous. Often they were homeless, smelly, grubby, had a reputation of rugged individualism with a commitment to the flock. And the shepherd's work, it literally took them to the fringes, for they were out for long periods of time, for days, in the fields with little to no contact with anyone else. 
And they continued on the fringes because when they worked with the sheep, they came into contact with blood, which made them unclean. And they could not be considered clean until they were in a place that they could be cleansed, which was the temple or the synagogue, and that, that, that was nowhere near where they were. And if they did come into contact with other people, they didn't want to get near them because if they got near them, they too would be considered unclean. Shepherds relegated to the fringes, marginalized. They were tolerated, but in no way esteemed. Even though, get this, even though shepherding was a vital occupation for the sacrificial system in the temple. Remember I talked about them, them um, putting the swaddling claws around Jesus? They worked hard for the temple system, but yet they were still marginalized. Even though in the history of God's people, patriarchs, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joseph, they were shepherds, and King David was a shepherd turned a king. But these shepherds were grouped with the tax collectors and dung sweepers. Religious leaders maligned the shepherd's good name, and shepherds were often labeled sinners, a technical term for a, for a class of despised people. So just as we see Luke's narrative move from the temple to the villages, to the outskirts, the fringes, to the fields, to the unlikely shepherds, the most unlikely of people, gritty, grubby, smelly shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem, we see the movement of a doggedly pursuant God toward those he longs to call beloved friends of God in a way a bunch of Theophiluses. The dogged pursuit of God toward those he longs to call beloved. Luke demonstrates to us the radically inclusive nature of God's kingdom and love for the world in the unlikely barren Elizabeth, in the peasant teenage girl in Mary, and the socially outcast shepherds living on the fringes. It's to them that the angel announces good news of great joy. Luke speaks to us of the far-reaching love of God, his mercy, and his grace. Are we catching the weightiness of this? The profoundness of it? For behold, the good news of great joy has come, and it will be for all people. And friends, I can't help but think, as I think about these shepherds, and cognizant to the fact that one that was laid in a manger, born in a manger, would indeed identify himself as the good shepherd in John 10, following in the footsteps of King David, the shepherd turned king. The shepherd, the good shepherd himself, was first revealed to the shepherds. Surely it was a prophetic picture of what was coming from the one who, when he looked out over the crowds in Matthew 9.36, Matthew tells us that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Like in the midst, in the bowels of his being, compassion for them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus came to restore the office of shepherd as one who protects and gives life to his sheep. The movement of God out to the fringes, indeed, was good news of great joy. Into the darkness of 400 years of deafening prophetic silence and a bludgeoned submission to the Roman Empire in a world devoid of glad tidings for generations, the babe tumbles from heaven and the presence of God breaks through the barrier of sadness, loathing despair, and joylessness to bring the good news of a Savior. So great and boundless would these words of joy be that they might compensate for all of humanity's pain and anxiety and sorrow, a joy that would now find its home in the heart of the Savior Jesus Christ, not in any ritual or religion or elitist movement for the best and the brightest, but for the lost and the wandering and the lonely and the uncounted and the overlooked. Good news of great joy for all people. All people. And then in verses 11 and 12, we hear this, and I'm just going to reread them for us. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be, and there will be a sign for you. 
find a babe wrapped in swelling clothes and lying in a manger. In a manger. Verse 11 says, for unto you. Verse 10, good news of great joy for all people, and then for unto you. The good news of great joy is for all the Elizabeths, all the Marys, all the shepherds, all the people, safe harbor and salvation for the lowly, the humble, the servant, the servants, the least of these, to you, shepherds, unto you, shepherds. Yep, the shepherds, they were included in all people. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 2, we hear that um, all went to be registered. But the shepherds, they didn't go to be registered because they didn't have a home. But yet, the angel tells them, comes to them, on the fringes, unto you is born a savior. To the lowest, to the one smelly and grubby and frowned upon, to the least of these, good news Good news for the unlikely and all those in their unlikeliness. It was assumed that this King Messiah would come for the ruling, the rich, and the religious. But the good news of great joy that broke into the darkness, that blessed night, turned things up on end. Jesus would later go on to say that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And if you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto my people. Jesus came for all people. God's kingdom turns things up on end. And the Shekinah glory that dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was inacceptable, inaccessible except for one time a year, when the high priest would go in and he'd have a rope tied around his leg. Because if he went in there and he was struck dead by the glory of the Lord, they could pull him back out. But that Shekinah glory that dwelled in the temple, it appeared to the shepherds on that most holy night and it broke into the darkness, the dead of night, forever opening up the way. For whosoever will. For whosoever will believe. For all people, for unto you. You collectively, you personally. For all people and for you, all and for you. For into the dark and dead of night and unto you the glory of God shines. For unto you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the unlikely Savior. At the beginning of Luke 2 as well, we hear that Caesar Augustus ruled. Inscriptions around the Roman Empire said of him, Savior and Lord. You see, Caesar, he claimed deity, self-confessed Lord and Savior of the world, the one who would save the people, a Savior who forced submission and bludgeoned by his imperial hand the people of the empire. And into this empire and self-confessed Savior comes the true, the true Savior, diametrically opposed. This born in a manger Savior for whom there was no room in the inn, came emptying himself in the likeness of man, made himself of nothing, made himself in the form of a servant. He humbled himself. Jesus came exposed as the shepherds were exposed that dark and wondrous night. Jesus stooped, assuming mild and meek from heaven to establish his Father's kingdom and bring people home. For that was the literal meaning of Jesus' name. God saves. The name given him from the angel and the pronouncement to Mary, God saves. Not saved by Caesar, not saved by any other name, nor by any other person, but Jesus, through whom God saves. Born in an unlikely place and way to two and four in an unlikely people was the unlikely Savior. And as the shepherds, they go with haste, the word tells us, and they speed over several miles from the fields to Bethlehem to see the sign of the Savior. There, wrapped in swallowing claws, lying in a manger, is the babe named God Saves And the shepherds, they step in close. The reality is that the manger with the Savior can only be approached by the shepherds. You see, no one else 
No one else wanted to walk into that hay moist with animal excrement. The shepherds were used to that. They even smelled like that. The unlikely shepherds, they received the good shepherd who stooped low for all the sheep, helpless and harassed. In the glory of manger hay, shepherds become the sheep. The good shepherd saves. I'll say that again. In the glory of manger hay, shepherds become the sheep that the good shepherd saves. And I'll end with this. I'm reminded as I share about this of my grandma Marge, who was my father's mother. She's been gone now for 20 years, and I attended and sat in church with my grandma. I nestled under her gushy, protective arm. I felt warmly secure with her, even though we sat in the proverbial cold metal gray chairs. Anybody ever sat in those things? I felt warmly secure with her there. She modeled for me the commitment and joy and value of gathering for church. Grandma was inviting and present and consistent. She persevered in a hard marriage. And she always made sure I knew how welcomed and loved I was. My grandma got her hair done every Friday, which during the Christmas season included a little sparkly glitter in her hair. But she also loved to put a tiny little sticker on the corner of her glasses. And one of my favorite memories of her was when she stepped close and she stooped over to my eye level and she said, look into my eyes. And she would whisper to me, you are the apple of my eye. Oh, to be loved like that? It wasn't until years later that I heard my grandmother talk about the ways in which she was a young girl and she felt so unlikely. She grew up on a farm in Peru, Nebraska. She went to country school, and she was unchurched. Her friends all went to church. They talked about it all the time, and she felt like the outsider. Missing out and excluded, she was the unlikely. My grandma longed to be included and to be on the inside, and when she reached an age where she could go to church by herself, she did. And from that day forward, she was at church. Every time the doors were open, somewhere along the line, she came to know the good shepherd. You see, my grandma was one of those unlikely shepherds living in the fields that God came, and he came for her. And she made her way with haste through those church doors and never looked back. She was welcomed and loved just as she welcomed and loved me and nestled me under the gushy, protective arm of hers. And you know, those words that she whispered to me when she looked into my eyes, you are the apple of my eye. They came from scripture. Psalm 17, 8. Surely, grandma knew those words for herself, whispered by the babe in the manger, turned good shepherd. Friends, we too are the unlikelies for whom Jesus came. And by faith, we too become his beloved. The unlikely Savior has been born for us to bring the good news of great joy in the midst of dark times. And 2020 has been one of those years. This is the good news of great joy for all people in all times throughout all time. For unto you, for unto you and you and you and me too, good news. So this morning I ask you, in what way do you feel like an unlikely? In all your unlikeliness? Where in the dark and dead of the middle of the night? Where is that place that needs the glorious message of good news? And who is it that's vital to this current system and community that is relegated to the fringes and the margins. 
Friends, this is good news for all people. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus, you are the good shepherd who calls to all the unlikelies of this world to fulfill the mission revealed in your name, God saves. Lord, help us to hear your voice, to hear your heart, to hear afresh and anew the amazing love you have for us and the pursuit with which you have pursued us. We prayed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, Amen.